go at it. And when you have a go at dynamic soaring, there's so much of this unseen energy that's in the sky that a lot of people have broken their planes when they've had a go at it because it's so so fast that uh, they, they call it the dark side. So uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how you can get into the, the peaceful world of silent flight. And as I say, we'll talk about just towards the end about competitions and, and world records and things like that. So, um, but, you know, I think the, the most important thing is to just sort of talk about the basics for, for maybe people that have only ever had a go at uh, power flying. Uh, and as was mentioned earlier, we'll sort of do a few slides, but this is very much for you, the, the 280 odd people that have signed in uh, to get the information out of it you want, want to tonight. So please ask your questions and every so often we'll stop and Andy and Mark will prompt me with some, some questions. So are we talking about gliding? Uh, I suppose we could say we're talking about gliding. Um, most modern model gliders and now full-size gliders are often electric powered and they call them that a fez, a forward electric sustainer. So people say to me, well, they're just powered aeroplanes really, aren't they? And I, and I say, well, no, once you turn the motor off, what you're actually looking to do is to be able to sustain your flight indefinitely or for prolonged periods of time by encountering some form of lift, um, slope lift, thermal lift, dynamic soaring lift, or even wave lift. Um, and I sort of go to my next slide about this whole definition of what silent flight is and and gliding and we've got a foot you know Andy's a full-size pilot and he's flown some fairly interesting planes in his life um, but I suppose some people would define the shuttle as a glider but it's you know it's a lifting body uh, it, uh, but if you look at the plane on the right now is that a full-size B-52 or is it a model glider well the answer is it's a model glider so depending on the conditions you fly in, whether it's thermal soaring or slope soaring, if you can sustain flight, then I, I see that as silent, silent flight for prolonged periods of time. And quite often these power models make excellent, uh, full-size powered planes make excellent uh, gliders because they've got high aspect ratio wings, they're designed to carry big payloads. So when you make them smaller um, and they're fairly lightly loaded, they fly really well. And they are in, also incredibly realistic. So they're, they're they're quite a popular form of, of silent flight, especially in the UK. So let's just sort of uh, reiterate the areas. We talk about flat field flying, thermal soaring, and that can be done with, well, we will be talking about it with tow line and bungee launching, uh, winch launching, which sort of superseded both tow line and bungee launching. And then we've got aero tow launching. And then we talked about uh, FEZ, forward electric sustained flight. And of course, back to the good old days, probably where a lot of us came in when we were smaller lads, we all had chuck gliders. DLG or discus launch gliding now is a very, very popular uh, type, type of gliding. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then we'll, we'll talk about slope soaring and dynamic soaring and also alpine soaring, which is a strange sport because you stand on top of a a big mountain there doesn't seem to be a breath of wind so is it slope soaring is is the hill generating some lift for you uh, it's not a flat field where you would go and fly and use thermals to sustain yourself and you chuck a six seven ten twenty kilo model off a four thousand foot abyss uh, and expect it to fly and because of the weather conditions there there can be very very strong lift and uh, that's something that uh, is very popular in europe so let's just talk about the sources of lift. I'm going to go through each, each one of them. What, what sustains a glider, keeps it up um, on the flat field, often for hours. You know, the world record for thermal soaring flights is significant. Uh, slope, the slope world record, which we had at Ivinghoe Beacon in the UK, we're talking about 30 hours plus. Uh, and I say the Russians got that. And then this new form of flying that came in sort of slope or gliding that came to, to be dynamic soaring where we see these fan, fantastic speeds now, world record speeds. And then if, if we've got full size glider pilots with us, we there's wave lift and wave lift traditionally can uh, be sought out quite, quite high. But I've been to a number of thermal competitions in the UK where the site's been affected by wave lift and it's made a bit of a, a mockery of the competition. But it is possible for models to use wave lift both off, off the flat field uh, and when you're flying on, on mountains, et cetera, where you've got other mountain ranges in front of you. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about how those forms of lift are formed and, and how you can use them to fly. So let's talk about 
thermals. I think everyone probably sort of thinks they understand the thermal. Um, the ground gets heated up during the day um, and bubbles of air are, are released from the ground. And I suppose one of the things that a nuance of, of thermals is that they're a bit like a, a weather balloon. You see pictures of weather balloons being released and they're the size of a large football. By the time they get to, to, the, to the edge of the atmosphere, they're the size of St. Paul's Cathedral. Well, that's what happens with a thermal when you've got a good source of a, of a thermal, like a ploughed field, where you've got some uh, colour differential to the, the rest of the ground around you, the ground will heat up and a thermal will pop away and that will be at the pressure of, of the ground level where the, the thermal is released. As it climbs, it's climbing up through air, which has got less pressure to it. So the thermal starts to expand and get quite a, a bit la larger. And then eventually, on a really good day, there'll be a condensation level and clap clouds will form and then we were just talking about it before the presentation started today was a classic case very blue skies this morning clear got quite good convection quite bright sunlight for this time of year and by four or five o'clock this afternoon some very large cumulonimbus clouds had formed at the condensation level um, with with hail storms and and heavy rain so if it wasn't so windy today would be a perfect thermal soaring day actually so when you, you, you go thermal soaring, you're looking for good sources of, of thermals. Um, and as I say, ploughed fields, towns, if you've got a flying field that's on the edge of a town, later on in the afternoon, quite often forested areas, they'll heat up and hold their, their heat all day. And then they'll release their heat as the afternoon goes on and you'll get very, very strong thermals. Of course, with anything like the old saying, what goes up must come down. So if air is rising somewhere, air must be sinking somewhere. So as a thermal pilot, whether you're uh, flying in one area or flying from place to place, you need to try to avoid the areas of, of sink. Uh, and as a, you know, power flyers who maybe never done any thermal soaring, when you're standing on the ground, there's some really good signals of, of thermals in the air. For instance, if you're standing on a very calm day at your field and the wind suddenly reverses through 180 degrees, you'll know that there's probably a thermal behind you because the thermal is drawing air into it from the ground and that's the sink and then it gets sucked up into the thermal where you'll get large swings in in wind direction so you know with thermals there are days when there are better days for thermal soaring and days when it's not so good for thermal soaring and actually you can have a very bright sunny day with a high temperature but because there's no condensation level or the condensation level is very high or you have no inversion then it's uncapped the heat keeps rising up to a very high altitude and you don't get the formation of the clouds. You need this condensation level to, to drive really good thermal conditions. Um, and just if you look at the diagram on the right there, where it says good lift, when you get to the top of the thermal under the cloud, full-size glider pilots, hang glider pilots, uh, um, uh, I, was trying to think, I was trying to think of the guys that we all hate when we go, so, sorry, the um, paraglider pilots, they all talk about what like they call the, the cloud engine, just underneath that cloud, where the air is going up and compressing under that condensation level will be the strongest lift. So if you've got clouds that are not too high and you're flying a model and you can get well underneath that cloud, you will find the strongest lift and be able to sustain long periods of time when you're, you're up really high. And then just things to think about with a thermal, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, that diagram is correct. All thermals have a rotation to them. We see that a manifestation on the ground is a twister and they all spin in, a, in the same way as the water does down the, the plug hole. They all go in an anti-clockwise direction. So I'm not going to answer the question, but if you watch full-size gliders and birds fly, they tend to circle in a particular direction all the time if they can. If they get to their first, especially a full-size glider, they're the first person to the thermal, and they can choose the orientation of circling. They will circle in a certain way in the northern hemisphere, and they circle in a different way in the southern hemisphere to, to maximise the lift. So... Uh, maybe we'll come back later on and answer that question about which we, way we think is the, the most optimum way to turn it in, in a thermal. So that's, that's one sort of source of lift. Um, and sort of typical values, just to, to, uh, to move on, in the UK, uh, the sort of heights that we fly model aeroplanes at, if you get two to three metres a second vertical component in a thermal, you're doing really well in the UK. Uh, when I go to competitions in... Germany and in France, it's not unusual to get six to seven to eight meters per second 
lift um, because of the continental climate. So uh, if you're good at thermal soaring in the UK, quite often you'll go to European competitions and you'll be uh, significantly better than some of our European counterparts because we, we're used to fairly weak lift in this country. Slope lift. Uh, well, I suppose we've all driven along and seen a hill, big hill, and with the wind blowing on it and seeing birds flying in it. It's very simple. Wind's blowing along the hill, up the hill. It's got nowhere to go. It's, it's forced up and creates a, a wave of, of lift like this. And if the wind's fairly straight onto a, a decent sized slope, you can slope soar. Uh, and if the wind is on that, that slope you can fly for as long as you want to as long as your batteries will last as long as your mind will last as long as your physical abilities will last and um with the world record that was set at Ivinghoe the only reason they didn't go longer than they did was eventually the wind dropped away to a point where they were no longer able to, to fly a very popular form of, of, of uh, silent flight great fun you can go and, and fly and practice for hours and hours and hours it's uh sort of reminds me a little bit slope soaring is when i first got my first four stroke model and i think it had about a 16 ounce tank in it and my dad and i were flying and we flew it for about half an hour and we kept swap, swapping the the box with each other because we were getting mentally fatigued uh flying slope soaring is like that you can literally go throw a plane off a slope and, and fly consistently for hours and hours so uh why would you go slope soaring well it, in this country, we are gifted with incredible sights. Uh, we have the access right to roam through the countryside. We've got footpaths. That's that's a slope in Wales, or right on the Welsh border. The absolutely beautiful sight there. You can see it. Beautiful aeroplane. Uh, you know, when I go, I've been to America to competitions. And you you drive along in a car with an American model. And you say, "Oh, that looks like a great hill. Why can't we fly there?" And he says, "Sorry, we're not allowed on that private land. We are so lucky in the UK that we, we have the access we do. But also geographically, we've got some of the best slope soaring sites in the world. They've got great, uh, great slope, sort of angular slope to them. Nice sharp edges, super super landing area with with grass, no rocks in the landing area. So um, you know, it's it's not only is it a fantastic experience slope soaring." We're sort of very lucky to, to ha have what we have in this country to, to, uh, to take advantage of. And one of the things that's really good about slope soaring is it's great for your model flying skills. You have to turn left and right at the end of each uh, transit of the slope. Typically, turning into the hill is uh, fairly difficult if you're low. And so one of the things I see with a lot of power flyers is they go and do some slope soaring and they come back, especially if they're doing an achievements scheme, and they suddenly find being able to do right and left-handed circuits com a completely different skill to when they uh, had just done some power flying. Um, so something that sort of came about in the 80s and I, um, is this dynamic soaring. And we should have all known about it when you drive along in a car and we all started getting hatchback cars in the late 70s and early 80s and you wash the car and then drive down the road and very quickly the the back windscreen of the car would get covered in in grime or or mud uh, that you would realize that there was a, a vortex at the back of the car where the, the flat roof of the car suddenly raked down at an angle let's say at 45 degrees and the same that happens when you're on a slope if you're flying at a which is a classic slope soaring site uh, and you have a, a hill which is more of a, a v shape like that a, a pyramidal hill or an arete you get this boundary layer effect and a vortex at the back of the, the hill and the, the air rotates round and actually starts to blow back up the other side of the hill. But if you go and stand on some really big hills like Malvern or Skirid and the wind's blowing from the west where, where A is and uh, you walk to the back of the hill, you can actually see the grass blowing back up the other side of the hill. And the energy there is absolutely phenomenal. And in the early 80s, as I say, people started to discover there was lift there and fly their, their planes in the, the back side of the hill, as it's called, or the dynamic soaring side of the hill. Um, such, such is the smoothness of air because of the rotation and the energy in, the, in there that it soon discovered that the lift was very, very much stronger on the back side of the slope than it was on the front side of the slope. Um, and some people call it the dark side of flying because the, the models will accelerate and continue to accelerate quite often exceeding the physical strength of the airframe very, very quickly. And a lot of planes in the early, the early days were destroyed at, on, in dynamic soaring because, because of the speeds. Uh, and so the, to prove that point, if I just go to the next slide, 
this was something that a lot of people may have recently seen on YouTube. This, this gentleman here broke the world, uh, unofficial world, world record, but world record for dynamic, dynamic soaring with this plane at 548 miles an hour, which is, when you watch the video of it, is just, it's hard to comprehend how fast that aeroplane is going. Um, very difficult to do those sorts of speeds in this country because that's set at quite a high uh, altitude. The, it's at Parker Mountain in California and you're flying six, seven, eight thousand feet up where the air is, is much thinner. Also, the air density is different and there's very little humidity in the air there. Whereas if you try to go and do dynamic soaring and get those sorts of speeds in the UK, uh, the mountains in Wales, and etc., you can imagine with the moist, moisture laden air sweeping off the Atlantic, it's much more dense and, and lower in, in altitude. And then sort of finally, um, wave lift, which is talked a lot about in full size gliding and is used to set altitude world records. And for many years, we had the altitude world record in the UK set in Scotland, which was sort of in the 30,000 feet region. That's now been well and truly surpassed by the Perlon project, where the world record is somewhere in the 80,000 feet region over the Andes in uh, South America. But if as, as a well, I think we've probably all been close to a river where you've got some rocks or pebbles in the bottom of the river and the water's flowing over the pebbles and you you notice this wave effect in the water that is mimicked downstream of the of the the pebbles in the water and that's the same with with wave lift the air rises up over the mountain range it drops it compresses and then it gets forced back up and you get these waves of of lift uh, and quite often there's lenticular cloud forming in it at the tops of, the, of where the wave lift is so that's the different types of uh lift i've noticed you've got five questions on the q a would you andy and mark you, are there any yeah. ones that yeah great that like yeah. To... great question from kester payne what are the rules around which slopes you can fly from in the uk okay it's a really good question um, and it sort of prompts a little bit ab about um, getting into it, but I've got it on my next my next slide, actually, location and availability of, of sites. Um, most National Trust sites are available to people to fly unpowered model gliders. So you, you can have a motor on your glider, but you're not allowed to use it on those sites. A lot of the National Trust sites will have a relationship with a local model flying association. So... If you look at the Long Min, for instance, there's a Long Min Soaring Association. If you look at White Sheet, there's the White Sheet Soaring Association, Ivinghoe Soaring Association, and they grant access or um, permission to fly at those sites. And now, typically, you don't have to be a member of those associations to, to, to fly, but the National Trust sort of control the, 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 the if you like, the marshalling of the flying to, to associations. So if you've got the right of access to the site with the landowner, um, whether that's a national trust or maybe a private landowner, and they, they're happy for you to use it, then you can just go and fly as long as you obviously take into account Article 16 and be careful with the, the general public. Because if there's a right to roam and a footpath, then you, you'll be flying a model aeroplane with, with the general public. But the many, many slope soaring sites in the UK, the North Yorkshire Moors, uh, Dartmoor, the, the, a lot of the places down in Devon and Cornwall that are on the coastal path, they're, they're all uh, great places to fly. And as I said earlier in my slide, we're very, very lucky in this country that we have access to freedom of access to those public open spaces where we can fly aeroplanes in a model aeroplanes in a controlled way. Greg, thank you. You you actually answered Dave Hodgkinson's question as well at the same time, so two two with one stone there. Um, Mark Harris asks, the slope soaring record you mentioned, is that for one person flying constantly or the model, uh, or the model, but with a shift of pilots flying? I think this is the one at um, Ivanhoe you refer to. So predominantly you have to have one pilot and it's like all these world records. If you're doing the world sit up uh, world record or you're doing um, a guy who was 63 broke the world plank record, you're allowed to have five minutes off, let's say, every hour for a natural comfort break. There are rules that the FAI rules are such that um, at every hour, I think you're allowed several minutes off and you can then either take that in the hour or you can fly for five or six hours and have 10 minutes off to have a break and a, a co-pilot takes over. But there has to be a predominance of one pilot for a period of time. 
uh, and it's it's a large majority of the time. Thank you. One more question, and then we'll let you crack on. Um, Tim Kersley, what are your thoughts on the use of Averio, good or bad? Um, it's a really good question. If you've got aspirations to be really good at F5J, which is the international thermal soaring class that seems to have settled in the, the rules, then I would say you're better to practice without Averio because they're not allowed in that class. If you're doing anything else, whether you're slope soaring or flat field flying, um, then a Vario is a fantastic piece of kit. And if you were a full-size glider pilot, you would feel that you were going into your flying with a piece of instrumentation missing probably almost as much as your altimeter. Um, so it, I would, you know, it's a fantastic tool to have uh, if you're if you're a sports or recreational pilot. And of course, there are disciplines like F5B and GPS triangle racing where the technology is very much allowed. And without a Vario, you would be competing. Uh, with a disadvantage but i would say if you're sports flying our vario is fantastic thank you okay all right we'll move on so how would we get started into silent flight i suppose i think you'd have to consider what tickles your fancy really if you want to have a go at thermal soaring then there's no reason why if you're a member of a power club that you couldn't buy yourself a, a thermal soarer and fly that at your your local site um one of the reasons that you may want to do silent flight is that you want to have a more relaxing environment, a silent flight environment. So you may want to seek out a soaring association or a club that is just a, a thermal soaring club, for instance. Um, but as I said, said before, you know, we've got some fantastic soaring associations in the UK. We've got the silent flight technical committee in the BMFA that's got some really good information on its, its web page. And then we've got um, BARCS, British Association of Radio Control Soarers, and there's a number of special interest groups within that or outside that, but very much under the, the sort of joint nature of, of the BMFA and Barks as there's F3F, et cetera. So there's a, there's a myriad of information out there for the, with the special interest groups and BMFA and, and Barks. And then there's a scale soaring association as well. So, you know, I would think you want to would want to decide what you're really attracted to, whether you wanted to have a go at scale or thermal soaring or slope soaring. Um, and then start to mine the internet and look at the different uh, groups and, and hook up with people and start to pick people's brains uh, on good models, etc. And there is so much really good information out there. Uh, and from that, you're going to decide whether you're going to do flat field flying or you're going to do slope soaring. Um, and as I said, you know, we're so lucky. The availability of really good sites, both flat field sites and, and slope soaring sites in the UK is, is fantastic. And then... It, just like power flying, you know, you can buy yourself a really good foam glider and make your mistakes and break it a few times before you move up, move on to something more sophisticated, which you and it's an actual building your own plane. Or if you some of the pictures I'm going to show later, you know, the, the modern trend very much with um, model gliding is for, for people to fly molded planes, whether they're DLGs, thermal soarers, or, or slow aerobatic planes or scale planes. Molded planes very, are very, very popular. And as I say, clubs and associations are a really great place to start. Um, and as, as I say, there's so much information on the internet. Um, but I, I will put a pack together afterwards, an information sheet, and sort of give you lots of good links and things that people can go to to, to, to see where, where to get going. So let's just talk about so it's the competition side, but more the structure of the different types of, of silent flight. And I suppose where a lot of people start off is in thermal soaring. They're a power flyer. They're at a power field. They've got the, the opportunity to, to build something with a, we'll buy something with an electric motor and take it to the field with them when they fly. Maybe you fly most of the day and about four or five o'clock in the evening, people start to go home and it quietens down a bit. And you think, well, I'll have a go at winds dropped at some thermal soaring. So, it's, you know, that, that's a really good way to get into it. Um, and then there are a number of international classes within thermal soaring, of which uh, the top one is F5J, which is a man-on-man 10-minute -man slot. You have a certain amount of height that you can gain with your electric motor, and there's a whole point scoring system about how high you climb up to a 200-meter limit, which for every height meter you climb, you lose a point, but then for every point that you fly or second that you fly, you get a point, and then there's a precision landing at the end. Uh, and that's a really, really popular class, very, very competitive. And modern 
F5J planes, multi planes are incredibly light. They've got wing loadings down on the four and a half ounces per, per square foot. There is a minimum wing loading. And you can see people hand launch F5J gliders, even in the UK on, on sunny days, and thermal them out of sight. They are incredible the optimized for thermal storing. Then we talked about some of the smaller classes and the, the picture on the bottom right there is a, what's called a discus launch glider so that you actually throw that. So back to my earlier comment about having a bolster wood chuck glider as a, a teenager, this, these are very, very popular classes. You, uh, you sort of spin around as if you're doing a shot put or a discus, discus. There's a peg on the end of the left wing tip. It's a right-handed person's plane and you launch the plane and again, super light, uh, could be really good guys can launch them to 70 90 meters um, but they'll they'll fly away in a thermal from 10 meters above above the ground um, and then there's been a little electric version of that now coming on called f5k and then there's some what i would call almost like low technology cars classes coming in now these new f3 res which stands for rudder elevator and spoiler and they're predominantly built up planes with a bungee launch. It's going back to how thermal soaring was in the 70s and 80s. Low technology, easy to do, low, low cost. And then a lot of thermal soaring in the UK at local club level is done to, to local rules. So I used to be a member of the, the Aylesbury Model Flying Club. They have a, a summer league. All the power flyers have got thermal soarers. And as I say, when the, it gets to the evening and it quietens down, they have, they have thermal comps and they, they have sort of local rules, which are a derivative maybe of the F5J rules. And then if we look at some of the more exotic classes, multitask classes, which typically involve flying the plane at speed, flying the plane over a long distance, and then doing the thermal soaring task, they used to be F3B. That seemed, that's still a, a, a task, but it's died out in the UK. And then you've got F5B, which I personally fly, which I say I call the Formula One of uh, model gliding they there's two three tasks in that there's a speed task for three minutes a duration task for 10 minutes and then a precision landing um, those planes are really spectacular they do not to 200 miles an hour in two seconds uh, they're capable of thermal soaring at somewhere between 25 and 30 miles an hour and they have a wing loading of around 24 ounces per square foot but they can pretty much once the wind starts to get over 10 to 15 miles an hour outfly most f5j thermal soarers in in a duration task. So they're very, they're very spectacular. And then there's a new class coming along, which is F3J, which is the electric version of F3B, which um, died away really because of the requirement to have a big team of launchers and a winch, etc. And then for the people that watched it, um, there's GPS triangle racing. That's something that's uh, really taking off. And then the other thing you can do on the flat field, which is a lovely uh, sport or hobby to do because it's got the aesthetics of owning beautiful planes is uh, aero towing. So if I move on to the next slide, you can see some typical planes there. So you've got a plane top left there that's a plane that you'd aero tow. You've got some GPS planes there. You've got a plane being aero towed. But then conversely, you've got a Radian there, which is a foam plane, which is a great entry level model for, for thermal soaring or even flying off the slope on a, on a light day. And then on the right, there's a picture of a, a sort of very modern F5J plane with uh, ailerons, flaps, multi-surface with polyhedral. Uh, very, very optimised for, for what it's doing. And then on the bottom left is an F5 blue plane just about to do a precision landing. So those are sorts of typical planes that you might see being flown on a flat field at different places in the, in the UK. So are there any questions at that point? Because I see the seven at the top of the screen. Uh, yeah, there is indeed. Um, yeah, Nish had asked earlier, and it's it's more appropriate now with you got some um, uh, some models on the screen. Nish had joining us um, from India, which is which is rather fun. Um, what is the maximum wingspan, and also what is the airfoil used? Um, and I, I that's sort of a general. What is the maximum wingspan? I, I guess. Well, in the, I suppose in the UK, you're controlled by weight and size, um, and you know you can get very large aeroplanes but you'd then be going for a, an lma certification you know i think up to 20 kilos uh you know you can see planes up to seven eight nine meters wingspan but if you look at the planes in those pictures then the smallest plane there's two meters and the biggest plane there is is five meters and that's not an untypical spread um and depending on what you're trying to do if you're trying to thermal soar then you'd have a, a section that's optimized for lift 
Uh, if you're trying to fly fast, which we'll go and talk about later on in the slope soaring section, you need to have a section that's it's optimized for, for speed. And then if you look at the GPS planes and the FIB plane in the bottom left there, they're optimized for both. Um, and the planes are often are optimized for both um, are the most enjoyable to fly because they're very fast, they thermal soar really well, and they're also very aerobatic. So, um, you know, the FIB plane, you can do some really not, sort of nice aerobatics with it. And um, people are all very surprised about how aerobatic that type of plane, plane is. So um, quite often competition classes, the same with power flying, they drive out planes that are really nice to fly um, because they have such a wide flight envelope. So it's, it's a very hard to say what's the optimum section. If you want to learn and have a plane that flies with thermals in very light lift or stay up in very light slope lift, then a plane with a, like the Radian or the plane on the right, the F5J plane would be the plane to have. Thank you, Greg. Um, Paul Turner asks, and quite appropriate as well, you're going through all the F numbers, where can we find definitions and rules of all the different F numbers? That's a really good question. Um, if you go onto the FAI web page, they're all there for the model gliding classes. And typically a three class is a non-powered class and a five class is an electric gliding class. So that, you know, if you start looking at the rules, F3J is a tow line thermal soaring class. F5J is an electric thermal soaring class, but they're, they're all on the, um, on the FAI page. The SFTC webpage has got some really good pages about the different classes and descriptions from people in the UK that do do those classes. So that's a really good place to look as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, just going back to the um, previous question from Nish Adam, Mike Phantom is, is sort of suggesting it's about the 584 mile per hour DS record model. <laughs> <laughs> But um, maybe you'll come back to that one later. Okay. Any um, more questions you want to ask? At this yeah, what, somebody asked earlier, Dave Hodgkinson, when we were talking about Vario, what is a Vario? Okay, so you can either have a barometric Vario or you can have an electronic Vario and it uh, measures the height of the aeroplane descending and climbing and gives out a tone. And depending on your preference, it's a generally a rising pitch in tone as the plane rises. And the quicker it rises, the faster the tone goes. And as the plane descends, you get a negative tone. Uh, and again, the faster it, uh, it descends, the more the, the tone goes down, it deeper in tone. Um, and when you've got lift and it's making a fantastic high pitch peeping noise, it's a very exciting thing to have in listening in your ear. When it's making a noise like a baritone and you're in four meters per second sync, it's a very depressing sound to have in your ear. So, uh, but that's what a Vario is. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, last, last question, Colin Walsh. Will you be discussing slope combat? Uh, yeah, we can t talk about it. Um, what, so if he, he, if he would, uh, Colin would like to phrase his question, put another question in whilst I go to the next few slides about what he would like to discuss in slope combat um we can't we can do um very been it's been a very popular form of slope soaring at some sites in the uk and typically done with foam flying wings because they're fairly indestructible um and been very popular in south wales for instance down on some of the slopes there i would say over the last few years i it, it's something that's seen less and less um and i think one of the issues with it especially with where we've had with lockdown and there definitely has been a huge increase in the number of people walking on slope soaring sites is that a lot of the guys that have been doing slope combat have been reticent to do it um, with the volume of people that ha have been around so uh, but you know if Colin wants to sort of ask a, a more refined question about it I'm very happy to discuss it. Thanks Greg. Um, other other questions that you'll you'll get, I think later on, will be uh, about equipment models, what's good for starters and things like that, beginners. So, um, okay. if you want to cover them now, or um, yeah, I mean, we let's. I think it's really good. So we, let's let's cover a, a few of these questions and then we can move. Okay. On. Well, Michael Fisher asks, what transmitters and receivers are dependable at the altitudes and distances encountered? Um. Well, I think most modern 2.4 radio, there's, 
I do have I do have my personal biases, but I'm not going to say them tonight. But uh, I think most modern radio gear 2.4 uh, works outside the, the 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 range of someone's eyesight with most of the model aeroplane, especially if the plane is tends to be at an elevation rather than horizontally away from you. Um, I would say most radio problems that occur in model gliders occur because the installation of the radio is not correct. And that can be for two, re two, two reasons. One, if you look at the planes, the high performance planes, the molded planes there, they have a high degree of carbon fiber in, in those planes and an electronics. Um, battery packs are a big blanking issue. So, that, you know, 2.4 doesn't like big lipos in the way of the aerials to the transmitters. So, you know, my experience is when people tend to have radio problems now, it's not the radio gear, it's, it's the, the installation and the operation of it. So, you know, I think there's, whether it's Free Sky, whether it's Jetty, if you tire, they're all great. And even, you know, people may say they've had problems with Spectrum in the past. I think I go fly now. And I think as long as people are using the correct spe uh, gear on Spectrum, it, as I say, it's down to more to user error than it is to, uh, to poor technology. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, Robin Whittingham, what model would you recommend for someone who, can't, who can fly slow with aileron but wants electric to help climb? Scale glass ship like the Jantar, about two and a half meter wingspan max. Cool. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to cop out of that. I'm going to ask the 299 people on board the, on the presentation. There's loads of uh, armchair experts out there um, to, <laughs> to uh, put a few quotes on the on there, and we'll come back to that one. I mean, I've got lots of, lots of opinions, but I mean, it, it, if you want a semi scale plane, do you want? Um, something that's like more like a hotliner or a, uh, what they call an F3X model. Uh, I think it depend, really depends on, on your def definition, but that, that there's very, very few poor planes out there at the moment. And one of the really nice things about model flying, I, th I think I've been doing it since 1973, is that you can, if you take some advice from people, you'll get a good plane. But I'll throw that out to the audience, actually. As I say, I think there's people with more knowledge than I've got about that sort of stuff. Yeah, the other one to add for that is Michael Kitchen's question. He's wondering um, how we tackle the cost of elements for starters, you know, encouraging the youth. So, again, that might be a good one for the audience if they've got any, if they know any sort of uh, low cost, you know, good models out there. Well, my, my view on that is you've got a plane there in the middle, which you can't get anymore, actually, which is a, a radium. Uh, but the, if, again, if you go on to lots of, the associations and forums there's lots of very good second-hand airplanes there in particular foam airplanes and you know you can get i i had a neighbor whose son wanted to to get going in it we found a second-hand multiplex easy glider um which was in really good condition and we got him going for about 100 pounds with with two packs and he pretty much taught himself with a bit of help from me to fly in the field at the back of his house um so you know my advice would be you know Get into the forums, get into a club, talk to people. Um, you know, there are lots of good secondhand aeroplanes. That is the way to, to get going into the sport, into, to, to, yeah, I think into power flying as well. But there are a lot of very good secondhand gliders out there. Brilliant. Thanks, Greg. We'll let you carry on. Okay. So let's talk a bit about slope flying. So obviously we talked about this concept of a, a pressure wave or a bow wave, if you like, blowing up over a, a hill. And uh, slope soaring competitions um, have evolved over time. If you look sort of a long, long time ago in the 80s and early 90s, cross country flying was huge in the UK. And that's where you would fly on, on a hill and there would be turn points, some in lift and some out of lift. And you would run or walk your glider around a course in a set time, normally a 40 minute uh, task. And you try to do as many turn points as you could. Uh, and generally, it was won by people who were good runners. That um, that's that sort of died away, really. There's only one or two cross-country events here, but it was a very nice way of flying. So today, the most popular form of um, competition flying is, is F3F in the UK. And there's the Great British Slope Soaring uh, Racing Asso Association, which is a very strong special interest group that's affiliated to the to Barks and to the BMFA, does lots of good work. And F3F is a really simple task. It came out of um, pylon racing. So there's some people listening tonight who, uh, with myself, did a lot of slopes or in pylon racing in the 70s and 80s. 
and you had four models at a time flying up and down the slope in just the same way as you would do with a Club 20 or an FAI power pilot racing. Um, and it was spectacular, fantastic fun, but um, it was a lot of mid airs. So when the Europeans saw, uh, saw this, they decided that they liked the concept of flying fast backwards and forwards along the slope on a set course, but they didn't like the idea of mid airs. So they came up with one up against the clock on a hundred meter course and you stand in the middle of the course and it's all timed and you have judging marshals beeping at each end um, and you all fly one at a time. And at the end of each round, the scores are normalized and you get a percentage of the, uh, of the fastest time. So if someone does 30 seconds for the 10 laps, which is a thousand meters and you do 60 seconds, you would get 500 points. And that's uh, the most popular competition class. Um, so other things, and we'll, I'll show you some photos in a minute, uh, in the UK, uh, scale competitions are still run and there's the white sheet club is very, very strong in scale. If that's something that you, you wanted to look at. And obviously the mention of, uh, combat, which is generally run at an informal basis at a club. So if you wanted to get into something like slate combat, you would need to find an association or, a, or a club or a group of guys, again, the forums, really good for this that are into that discipline so that you can meet up and and fly together um and then again something that was very popular which is doesn't happen anymore really is slope aerobatics um so if you really want to do competitions in slope soaring you're really looking at uh, f3f that's about the the only real competition that's active in in the uk at the moment so what do slope soarers look like well, on the top left there, you've got a state-of-the-art aerobatic slope soarer. Um, then you've got, believe it or not, a glider in the middle there. That's a PSS model, as, as is the planes at the, the bottom left there. And then the V-tail plane there is a typical F3Fs or sports slope model, F3X, as some people call them. Um, and there's many designs that like that. They all look the same. They're about three-meter wingspan, V-tail, and molded. And then on the right hand side, one of the things that um, which has happened in both power flying and model flying is the, the advent of the shocky or the, the foam model. And that's a plane called an Ahi there, which is basically like a foam sports aerobatic power model, but a glider. And it's fairly small, uh, flies in a variety of conditions from very light lift to strong lift. And uh, as you can see, it's doing a three turn spin there in, in that photo of, on the slope. So they're, they're typical sort of slope models from an aerobatic model through to PSS. Uh, and obviously we've had some photos earlier of big scale gliders. So then let's just talk about um, some sort of world records. We talked um, about the world endurance record. That's something that you could aim for. If you really into speed and DS has really captured uh, people's imaginations and there are areas in the country, for instance, uh, Russia Pedge, uh, up by Mam Tour, there are a number of guys that fly up there. That's one of the, the better places in the UK to do DS flying. And they regularly fly up there when it's a southerly and have a go at DSing. And one of the things you do need is a speed gun, of course, laser speed gun to, to uh, measure your speeds, which is, um, is set with using a tuning fork for the, to get the accuracy. And then there are, F, there are FAI cross country and duration records that, yeah, that you can look at as well. So I think there's going to be a lot of questions. So I, I, I wanted to get to this slide, uh, sort of summarize, and then let's, you know, really get into some questions from people um, and, and also open it up to sort of comments like what's the best plane and things. So, you know, what I would say is um, I think slope flying, thermal flying, lots of good secondhand planes out there, very easy to get into. But I think with all these things, I would talk to people that do it, I'd go and buddy up with people who are active slope sawers, active thermal sawers, and pick their opinions, take their opinions. Quite often they'll say, oh, yes, John's got a plane for sale. That would be a, a good plane for you. Uh, it's a low risk way of getting into it. Um, certainly, I'd always advocate joining a club or an association um, to, to get that knowledge. And what I would say, my experience, I started out as a power flyer and then I went uh, into glider flying. I was lucky. I had two, uh, as I talked about it in my article in the BMFA magazine. I had a guy who was a top aerobatic pilot in my club who taught me to fly. And I had a guy who was a top glider pilot. 
And my flying progressed more when I started to do silent flight flying, both off the flat field and the slope, because you haven't got the benefit of the motor. You have to rely on the energy of the plane and of the conditions to make the plane fly. And you become a smoother, more accurate pilot uh, as a silent flight pilot, which then transmits or transfers back into your power flying. Um, and I was a BMFA examiner for a long time, and a lot of people would try to get through their A and, and then their B test, and they would struggle with the whole left hand right handed circuit concept. And I would say to them, well, go and do some slope soaring because you have to turn left and right all the time and come back and have a go at your A or B certificate. And they would go and do a few months slope soaring and come back and they would never have a problem being able to do left and right handed circuits. So it's definitely got uh, benefits. One of the things that you know, I found with it is that uh, um, I put the picture up for Slope in Wales, my partner, that she loves to go walking. I go fly my plane, she goes for a couple of hours walk and comes back. It can definitely be a family, much more family orientated type sport than uh, power flying can be. And it's taken me to some of the most beautiful locations in the world to go to go flying. I mean, some of the flat field power sites I've flown at and in, in around the world in this country have been amazing, but slope soaring and, and thermal soaring, you, you, you go to some amazing places to fly. Uh, and of course, we talked a, bit, a little bit about it in the, in the GPS, the triangle racing seminar. People sort of say, oh, you know, my flying stagnates. And we talk about having an objective to your flying, you actually flying the plane and making it do something. So, you know, the, the BMFA silent flight uh, achievement scheme is really well thought out. It's good fun to do, um, even if you don't, uh do the achievement scheme you have a go at practicing some of the things in the a and b certificate it will really really force your your, your flying along and i'd say one of the really nice things about um gliding is with f3f and gps and thermal soaring there's all these personal challenges so with f3f it's about the fastest time you can get uh for that with gps triangle racing it's how many legs you can do in 20 minutes or half an hour depending on the task and with thermal soaring um you know it's in this country, we don't have such good conditions as the rest of Europe. If you can fly for an hour and a half, two hours with a thermal soar and not not put your motor on, it's a very satisfying thing to do and a very all-embracing thing. So I think one of the nice things about gliding is you can get some personal best with the activities you're doing and, and go out and try and beat them every time. So uh, it's got lots of really good attributes to it. So let's have a look at our questions because I see we've got about 10 up there. Yeah, Greg. Yeah, we've got um, got one. Been waiting for a little while to ask the question. How does the four hundred foot CAA limit affect that flat field uh, thermal soaring? Is it a problem or generally okay? That's well, Tim, Tim Morton, that was. Yeah, well, I suppose there's people on like Andy and yourself and the two Andys who are much more qualified to to answer that. Uh, unless you're in a controlled airspace, we can fly higher than that, uh, and it's all about taking appropriate action if a plane comes over that's 500 feet or lower um it's our responsibility to get out of the way but you know we can fly up to much higher than 400 feet and i think it's it's a common misconception amongst a lot of model airplane flyers that you have a minimum or maximum height of 400 feet yeah, it's contained within the article 16 authorization that came in on the 1st of january so for aircraft under seven and a half kilograms um, we have permission as BMFA members to fly above the 400 feet. Uh, the important thing is you maintain your, your visual line of sight, of course. Hmm. So. Andy, thank you, Greg, thank you. Um, I, would, I just would make a comment uh, on that, and it's the same with a power plane, actually, but if you've got a Vario and you've got back-channel telemetry to your plane, you know how high you're flying. Um, so, you know, I mean, first of all, it, it's no argument if a plane comes, I mean, we've had instances at several fields I flight where we've had light aircraft come across exceptionally low. We're talking about 200 feet. We know that because we've been following them on flight radar, but if you've got a Vario and you know, you're, you're at 400 feet and if you're doing some thermal soaring and someone's using an app like flight radar and they're standing next to you, spotting for you. And they say that plane's coming across, it's 250 feet. Well, you know exactly how high you are. You know how high you've got to go down to. So that's one of the real beauties of telemetry in, with modern radio control aeroplanes, whether it's a glider or a power plane. Greg, you segued brilliantly well into the next question. John Leach asks, how does the Vario work in transmitter to ground? Okay, so um, it works through the, typically works through the back channel um, and you, you can, depending on your radio, you can set it up. So there's lots of Vario... <laughs> 
mixing my metaphors a bit variables for the vario so you can uh change the the aggression of the beat rate and things like that but typically it comes out as an audio sound out of your transmitter uh and if you don't want to irritate people most people most transmitters have got a headphone jack so you can wear uh, a headphone in one ear but keep your other ear free to hear what's going on around you so um yeah, if you're standing on a flight line with a bunch of power flies with a Vario going, you might irritate them. So it's quite a good idea sometimes to wear a, have a set of headphones with you. <laughs> and, and Trevor Waters asks, are Varios allowed in competitions? So F5J, no. And most thermal soaring events in the UK to local rules, no. Um, F5B, GPS triangle racing, uh, yes, they are. Brilliant. Thank you. Now back to slightly more basics. Jeff Benton, does anyone still use bungee launch? Yeah, and F3, F3 Res um, is a class, uh, so F3 rudder and elevator and spoiler, or there's, F3, there's just F3RE, which is rudder elevator, is a class specifically designed for bungees. Um, and uh, several of the UK glider specialists have got good stock of, of bungees, T9, hyperflight, etc. So, yeah, I mean, I suppose... Where we've gone with lightweight lipos and electric motors, you can fly in a much smaller field with an electric glider without a bungee. You know, you, you, if your bungees, uh, the, the old rules for thermal soaring was you were allowed to have a 150 meter line. There was maybe 50 meters of rubber and 100 meters of uh, fishing line. Well, with silicon tubing, it stretches up to six times its length. So, you, you know, you could stretch it out well over 200 meters. Well, you need a field that's 200 meters long to, to get a decent launch. Um, so, you know, one, you've got to peg it out, roll it up and use it and then put it away. So there's nothing wrong with bungee flying. And if that, if that's really enjoyable and you've got planes or the, uh, bungee launch planes, get a bungee and, uh, go and fly them. Fantastic. You need a suitable field. And as I say, you know, electric planes have basically become so labor saving. You put the wing on, put the battery in and, uh, and fly them. So they have become the, the most popular way of getting into, into thermal soaring. Brilliant. Thank you. And I believe our Andy Sefton had a, an article in the BMFA News a couple of editions ago on F3 Res. So um, you can catch up on that if you dig through your old uh, BMFA News. Um, Colin Walsh, I've been enjoying combat with foam deltas for many years. My fellow com com combatiers, maybe, and I try and, and knock each other's models out of the sky. Are there any organised competitions of this type? Not that I know of. But um, the only thing I can think of is um, the Thames Valley Soaring Association, Soaring T TVS. They used to run a number of club events on different weekends for lots of different things. So they used to do 60-inch pylon racing. I think they have an F3F event. Uh, I'm, they may be saying, no, don't say this. But um, And I think they maybe even had a combat. But I, I don't think there's any formalised uh, slope combat model uh, competitions now but I, you know it's not my field of expertise um, uh, but I, I never see it on the Barks forum I mean I, I there's a guy called Dave Mordecai who um, is a very good pilot he's a very good power pilot but he's also represented Great Britain in F5D which is electric pylon racing and I know him and his friends he's got a group of about 20 of them they're very still into into slope combat I, I, I would think again if you sort of got onto the right you went on the barks forum and said hey is anyone in the uk doing slope combat you'll either get people say grow up and get something bigger or oh no we're all doing it fantastic come and join us i think that would be the way to seek out your your fret your fellow combatiers brilliant thank you um you might you might get this one jb try and explain the terminology pss for example so it's power scale soaring Sorry, yes, yeah, sorry, use the term didn't, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, any any tips on improving your slope aerobatics when I usually fly on my own? That's from Tony Parton Frost. Okay. Um, well, I suppose there's two schools of thought to a slope aerobatics. Some people fly crosswind and they do all the manoeuvres crosswind, so they do their loops and rolls and they do a turnaround at each end. And they fly very much like F3A aerobatics with, a, with an imaginary center line. And this, I suppose the slope controls the width that you can fly at and the type of plane you, you're, you're flying at. That's the best way to do your aerobatics. You'll get the most aesthetically appealing aerobatics by flying crosswind. It's a little bit more difficult than doing your loops and, 
and rolls into wind because you've got the energy of the, the wind to, to pull up against and you haven't got the drift. You're, but uh, And then that's little things like if you're doing rolling manoeuvres, like four point rolls, slow rolls, consecutive rolls, and you have a slight crosswind on the slope, let's say you're, you're flying looking at the slope and the wind is coming from your left shoulder, then do all your rolling manoeuvres with the downwind element of the, of the, the wind stretching your manoeuvres out and do all your looping manoeuvres going from right to left into the into the wind, you will get more energy imparted into the plane through your looping manoeuvres by using the slight crosswind on the slope. Fantastic, thank you. John Goldsmith, other than coastal sites, does anyone know of any slope soaring sites in East Anglia, say within 30 mile radius of Colchester? That's a good question. So we'll give people an opportunity to answer mm. that on the Q&A or the, um, on the other thing. Yeah, and there was one other question that um, our, our audience might be able to help us with. Does anyone know where you can buy a high start parachute in the UK? Sussex Model Centre can't get them anymore. So the guys that are selling bungee, so Andy um, might know this with the, with the F3 res. What are guys doing for the parachutes on F3 res? Um, I think Hyperflight have got them at the yeah. moment. Sorry, can you repeat that, Andy? Sorry, that was... Um, I think Hyperflight have them at the moment. Hyperflight. They were certainly okay. on their website when I last looked. Um, I haven't created a bungee for over a year because of covid but i know jim wright has mm. and he's listing in so maybe jim could come in on that one um later on but if you want to order from a board i think Holine models and lindinger they've got parachutes as well brilliant thank you um felix martin back on the pss could you explain it a little bit further please OK, so on a basic level, the idea is to create, uh, take a full size power plane. It can be a um, it can be a propeller driven plane. It can be a jet and turn it into a glider that you can fly off. Typically, they've, they've flown off the slope. They need a bit of lift to, to stay up. Um, and then there are there is in the Sonic Flight rule book and in the Barks rule book, there are rules to run a PSS competition. And so there's a bit of there's a ground judging element to it of the scale, how it looks. And then there's a flight uh, part of it, which is judged and the two are put together and you, you get a winner. And there are some still, I believe, for instance, um, I think there's a big PSS meeting in the Lynn, at the Lynn Peninsula. Um, it may well be August time. I mean, obviously, a lot last year. Very, very popular. Um, a lot of PSS models flown at the great orm because the lift is is so good um but the, the concept is to take a, a power plane uh, which is you know it's got the attributes that will make it um a really good sl slope soarer and fly it off the slope and produce a realistic performance and and funnily enough not so much in this country but um in australia and places a lot of people bought hobby king pylon racing planes then it'll come to me in a minute what it's called and they took the propeller off and they've flown the, those uh, slope saurus with the, the, with the packing and they go exceptionally well. So, the, you know, the attributes that quite often make a good pylon racing model or a good, you know, like a B-52, it's got a swept wing, it's got a big area, it's, it's designed as a full-size plane to carry a lot of payload. Um, they fly really well as gliders. Thanks, Greg. Um, John Minchell points out that uh, there's a chap on Barks who is building bungees for sale. So um, have a look there on the park website. There we go. Got someone local. Um, Andy Nelson is interested in trying F5B. What would be a good starter airframe setup? Well, OK, that's a really good question. Um, you can't go wrong. Well, first of all, we have got a starter setup. So if he wants to get in contact with me, I can give him. Um, we've got a, a warm liner set up. Hobby King Excalibur is fine if he's got one of those already. Um, there's loads of great second-hand FIB airframes in the UK that are for sale, mouldy planes of, of various states of um, pristineness, if you like. Uh, and there's lots of good second-hand motors and speed controllers. So, you know, what I would say is there's a competition at Warboys on that third Sunday in, in um, April. It's very welcome to come along to that and meet the guys. Um, there's an FIB Facebook page. Um, there's an F5B thread on the Barks Forum. You know, the, we got a new guy who came into F5B last year. He he 
put a thread on the F, on the Barks thing. Um, he, he is actually a very good pilot. He's adapted very, very quickly to it. So, I mean, it depends on how hot you want to go initially. Uh, but, you know, a good F5B competition plane running on 4 or 6S, if you're a competent pilot, would be the way to go. Um, good secondhand plane. And then just build up the power as you get more and more used to it. But get in touch with us, I would say, through the various uh, forums. Thank, thank you, Greg. Um, John Greenfield points out there's an app called Slope Hunter, which lists a lot of slope soaring sites in the UK. Uh, don't know whether you want to expand on that, Greg. Slope Hunter is absolutely brilliant. It's put together and it uses Google Maps to sit behind it. And you zoom in on location in the UK uh, and it you click on the, the, the drop pin and it will tell you the slope, the wind directions and all that sort of stuff. What I would say about Slope Hunter is um, it's very south of the UK orientated. So it's, it's almost um, a complete almanac of the slopes in the, in the south. It's a bit more sparsely populated the, the further north you go. But, you know, one of the things about the model flying, and I said it with the, in the GPS triangle racing thing is, you know, if you go on to... Um, in onto Barks, so or you go down to Facebook. Oh, there's a lot of Facebook has got some fantastic soaring um, threads, and you say, "Oh, I'm going on holiday to to North Yorkshire Moors. Is there anywhere to fly?" You will be inundated with people saying, "This is where you should go and fly." And oh, you know, let us know when you're coming up, and we'll meet up with you and things. Um, so there's just there is a plethora of information there. But Slope Hunter is really excellent. Brilliant. Well, Mark. Uh, Waskit asked asked about Cheshire, and John Mitchell has answered that, saying that the nearest proper s slope sites in Cheshire are Leek or close to Cheshire are Leek and Moorland Club and Long yeah. Mind, Mind in Shropshire, in South Shropshire. Well, if you yeah, if you live in Cheshire, you're within an hour of some of the best slope soaring sites in the country. To the north, up at Berry, you've got the Ribble Valley, uh, and if you've got a if you've got a strong constitution, there's a slope called the Big End at the end of the Nick of Pendle. That's probably one of the best slopes on sites in the country. Long Min's an hour and twenty minutes away. The Leek and Moreland Model uh, the Soaring Association they've got uh, some private sites, but they will let you fly as guests. They're a great bunch of guys. Again, they've got a great web page. It's got all the details of the slopes, the directions that they can fly in. Um, and there's the myth of the mermaid. So if you go and fly at Leek, you'll you'll meet the myth of the get wound up by the the myth of the mermaid at the Leek and Moorlands Model Flying Club. I think have you had a few beers at the pub just by the site you get to sit, the mermaid will make an appearance. So, but again, there's so much information, and all these guys in these soaring associations, they are you know so approachable. That that that's the best way to 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 to, to look at it. Brilliant. Thank you, um, Paul Wadder. Is there a database for airfoil coordinates used on the new GPS models? Can you download? Uh, that's good. I can't answer that question. I don't know if the answer to that, that question. John Greenfield may. It's good that he's on. Um, he may well know the answer to that. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm just flicking through. Oh, One of the things I would say about dirt plug sections, which are used on some of the models, uh, is he won't release that information. Uh, if you go on to RC Networks, and you look at the there's a thread that's a German so it's the German equivalent of RC groups. There's a thread about the Calvados. Philip Kolb, who designed that plane, has uh, absolutely disclosed all the information about that. So, but w whether there's one site with all that information, I don't think the answer today is yes. Felix Martin, um, I'm into aero towing. Could Greg elaborate on the subject of aero towing? Okay, um, it's. It's something that obviously um, you need a good you need a good tug pilot, someone who's got lots of experience. You need a field where you, you can do it. Um, I think it depends on the size of the model. We'll control the size of the the the, the tug that you, you need. I mean, John again with the Ghost Squadron. I think they've got a fair number of pilots that um, they use as tug pilots, and I think John might actually run some aero tow days. And I think there's some again advertised. I think it was there's been some aero tow meetings at. At Buckminster, I suppose the question would be, what, what sort of information would he like to know? Like techniques, for instance. I mean, how how you offset when you take off, when the tug turns to the right or left, where the plane need, needs to be. I'm sure if he's doing it, he'll know all that sort of stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, again, there's if you go on to ask the the scale soaring forum, 
uh, there's a lot of information about tug meets and people that are doing it. I mean, one of the, one of the issues with it is, you know, if you, you've got a big scale glider, you need to know someone who's got a tug. Indeed. I've, uh, uh, J John can unmute himself and pick that points up on that if he wants. Yeah, he's Greenfield. certainly got more, he's got more expertise than I have. Yeah. Evening, John. Evening. Sorry, I'm not on something where you can actually see me, but hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, we can. can. We can. <clears throat> okay, with regard to aero towing, first of all, there's two events at Buckminster this year um, dedicated to aero towing, predominantly scale flying, but uh, anyone with a glider with a tow hook on the front or anyone who even wants to learn to be a tug pilot is very welcome to come along. They are on the 22nd and 23rd of May and the 4th and 5th of September. Run at Buckminster, normal rules apply. Um, and we'd be very great, uh, happy to see you there and uh, come along and take part. John, thank you. Um, whilst we're into um, plug-in, uh, next Tuesday, don't forget, um, it's another silent flight, uh, glider GPS triangle racing. Uh, a little bit more information there from the uh, from the previous session. So um, make sure you get get booked into that. And if right. and I know from the first session that there has been a lot of interest and a lot of people have bought kit. I suppose terrible English. There have been a fair number of people that have expressed an interest, and there's been a good number of people that have bought bought kit. John's session really is the sort of must listen to next. Stage if you've if you've uh, if you bought some GPS kit. Thank you. Um, just a couple of we, we asked a couple of questions about beginners models or or certainly models mm. to start with. Um, the Radian is certainly very popular, although I think everybody's saying that obviously it's not made. And I think mm. you pointed that out. Um, Zag is a cheap, easy to build, very strong, and fly very well. Mm, true. Good um, slope. Good good slope soaring model. Yeah. Okay. Multiplex Melin. Mm hmm. Is a great plane. I think that's Merlin. Merlin. Yeah. Okay, it's just the typo there, or was it? No, it was a typo. Yeah, it's not me yeah. for a change. That's... And the Easy Glider. I don't know if it's that's a great plane as well. Uh, it does say that's Merlin. Well corrected there, Tony. Thank you for that. Um, what else have we got? Yeah, we've got somebody's already. Philip has already mentioned the Multiplex Easy Glide, the Bixler Two, and the Phoenix Two Thousand. Mm-hmm. Um. Dave Hodgkinson, Hobbykin, Durafly, Excalibur. I think yep. you mentioned that one earlier. Yep. Detail electric hotliner slope saw is about 150 quid. Uh, it's on his short list. Uh, slope Hunter is still a good source of slope soaring sites. FX Racer, Greg, is that? That's a clear. So, that, um, I, I, I used to, I used to so I'm getting age simers. I completely forgot the name of it. I used to have an EFX racer and I actually, it was a better plane as a slope saw than it was as a pilot, as a, a sort of a model. And I, I have flown it a number of times off the slope with the pack in with the propeller off. It goes really, really well. And uh, there's loads of videos on YouTube of, of guys in um, Australia and places flying them. It's, it's a super efficient airplane. It's a, a really good plane. If you've got one and you want to have a go at slope soaring, just take the prop off and have a go. Brilliant. Jim Wright um, from the Ivanhoe Club, make your own parachute or just use a suitable piece of lightweight, brightly coloured cloth. There is a minimum size to be visible. There you go. Um, top model is the Nike Evo or Nike. Evo, Evo. yeah. That's a good plane. Um, what else have we got on here? We are starting a few with that model. Uh, we also have an F. Oh, sorry, that's somebody else plugging next week but one. Um, yeah, twentieth of April. It's uh, it started in F five B. Yeah, and then the twenty seventh of April is a lot more about slope soaring. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Colin Walsh, fan built ridge runt, mm -hmm. and Paul Eisner, multiplex heron. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there's there's if you want to get into slope soaring, there's planes. Uh, like middle phase, if you can, get, you know, if you want to build it, I don't know if it gets available, but there's loads of good second hand middle phase around that. So that's a classic, um, um, great training model for someone who wants to get into slope drawing. 
my first RC slope saw that was. And I mean, an aileron version. Again, fashions have changed. You know, you don't when you when you go to Buckminster and see all you guys doing the training. I mean, you would never treat teach someone to fly on a rudder elevator camco cadet it's, it's ailerons it's the same with slope soaring now typically most most uh training at slope soarers have got ailerons i mean an aileron middle phase is a great way to get in if you can do a bit of power flying it into slope soaring yeah. right last last few questions um and they're actually more statements than anything but um balsa cabin sonata e is an excellent cheap and simple one from keith setchell mm -hmm. jim wright again the night radiant is still available Mm -hmm. uh felix martin sas wild thing yeah um gary hill any suggestions for an inexpensive dlg uh libel there you go libel mm. great plane it's one of those planes that outperforms what it's you know it it's specification and a lot of people have bought the bells it's, it's a foamy really uh, and had a lot of fun with them and then uh, Chris Voss, Phase 6. And Multiplex Easy Glider is still available. Mm. It's a great and plan. Nishad, with the last technical question, what's the most effective angle of incidence given to the glider, which can be used in max flight? Difficult to answer that one, but go on. <laughs> well, if it's an aerobatic plane, it will be zero, zero. Uh, you know... Um... If it's a GPS triangle racing model with an all-moving tailplane, it's got an infinite uh, angle of uh, incidence depending on the flap setting. And so it's an impossible question to answer. It really depends on what you're doing. Fantastic. Greg, that is amazing. We've got through 41 questions or 45 questions and a huge quantity of, of chat. And everybody's been really interactive this evening. So it's been absolutely wonderful. Um, Martin Dilley, not a question. But it is possible to correct the typo on the very first intro side silent flight before kit. Uh, no, it's already live on YouTube. It's already live. Sorry, Martin. <laughs> and that's my fault. And if you read the BM BMFA article, it was riddled with typos, and I am dyslexic, so I hold my hand up. I take full responsibility. I apologise. I was oh, I was no, listening. No apology not, necessary. No, I was listening, not reading. <laughs> so. It uh, it makes a great talking point. If I I did a. Uh, a paragraph on the use of English in my scale column in the BMFA news. And one of the first comments came that came back was that I've got the grammar wrong in it. <laughs> in <my> <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. You're not alone, Greg. Uh, uh, no. Well, hey, and uh, uh, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the things I would say, if there's any, any dads listening and they've got young boys and they're struggling to concentrate, I, I, I said it in my article, dad bought a Rager model at home when I was 13 and I was struggling to concentrate at school, and it model flying changed my ability to concentrate and my my lust for learning or my my thirst for learning because I, I wanted to learn everything about it, which meant you know I got better at school. So it's a been a fantastic hobby for me. And you know Jim writes on the Ivinghoe guys. We sit on Ivinghoe and regularly get families come up with young kids and they talk to us about slope soaring and model flying and. We talk about you know the fact there's electronics and physics and chemistry and, and everything and uh, it you know we've had a number of people go away and buy gliders and, and come back up so it's a it's it's a fantastic hobby and it's a shame we just can't attract more people into it i just want to say we've had over 200 people in tonight and um you know i i, I sort of put myself up for this i'm not sure if i've got anything to say that's relevant but i really appreciate everyone tuning in thank you very much we were up to 300 at one point and yeah, uh, yeah. so great, um, yeah. great job so I think we'll um, we'll start to wind it down from this point. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, we look forward to seeing you all or hearing from you uh, next next week with some more silent flights. And um, yeah, and thank you, Greg. Thoroughly enjoyable. Um, we all we're all uh, there for the the full well, nearly two hours, uh, nearly an hour and a half. Sorry, sums are bad. Thank you very much indeed, Andy. We can. Uh, we can yeah, stop the we can say farewell to the